Hi everyone, thanks for joining today. So today I thought I would talk a little bit about what is a chaotic system. So there are quite a few simulations on my channel of chaotic systems, mainly billiards, such as the Sinai billiard or the Bunimovic Stadium billiard. But you may have wondered how you actually define a chaotic system. So there are actually slightly different definitions depending on what type of system you're looking at. For instance, does it conserve energy or not? But the most important defining properties are the following. So one of them is that the evolution of the system in time should be more complicated than stationary, periodic or quasi-periodic. So stationary means that the system just doesn't move at all. It just stays uh, in the same state forever. Periodic means that it is cyclic, so it repeats after some time and then it keep, keeps repeating the same pattern. And quasi-periodic is a little bit more general than periodic. Uh, for instance, if you add two uh, periodic signals with different frequencies or periods, well, if, for instance, one period is a multiple of another, you will still get something periodic. However, if the ratio of the two periods is a irrational number, you will get something which never repeats exactly, but very often comes back to a very similar state, and that is called quasi-periodic. Now, a chaotic evolution would be something different than that. Now, another thing that is often associated with uh, chaos is sensitive dependence on initial conditions. So now what you do is that you don't just observe the evolution for one initial state. You take two initial states, which are different, but can be very close to each other. And then the evolutions for these two initial states should, after a while, get very different. So this is sometimes called the butterfly effect, and uh, it goes back to the meteorologist Edward Lorenz, who uh, coined this term in the 1970s. One way of saying it is that uh, ask the question whether the flap of a butterfly's wings in Brazil can set off a tornado in Texas. So it's not really that a butterfly can create a tornado it, that requires a lot of energy, but it is that small uh, causes can have big effects on trajectories of certain weather systems. So if you live in an area where there are hurricanes, like around the Gulf of Mexico, for instance, you will know that when uh, so these uh, hurricanes form off coast of Senegal, then they travel across the Atlantic, and their trajectory is quite predictable, but at some point it becomes very hard to say whether the hurricane will go more to the north or more to the west and uh, then very small causes can uh, have an important influence. So sensitive dependence on initial conditions makes system hard to predict. Now there are a few other properties that can also play a role. So sometimes the asymptotic dynamics of a chaotic system happens on a set with fractal properties called a strange attractor. Though this is not the case for all chaotic systems, so you have to have some dissipation to have an attractor. Another property is that chaotic systems often have an infinite number of unstable periodic orbits. So they are periodic, they repeat after a certain time, but they are unstable, meaning that if you start a little bit away from uh, this unstable periodic orbit, you will do uh, something very different. And uh, the number of orbits of a given period will grow exponentially with the period. So the longer the period, the more orbits you have. And then there's also a whole lot of statistical properties, like ergodicity and mixing, 
so ergodicity is a property that says that if you make averages over long enough time intervals, they can actually be predicted by replacing them by averages over all possible states of the system. And mixing and decay of correlations are even stronger properties that somehow say that the system will forget its initial state after a while. So today I want to talk about a number of quite simple examples. So they are among the simplest examples of chaotic systems. And the first of these examples is called the dyadic transformation. So what I do here is that I have a, a map from the interval 0, 1 to itself, which is given by x maps to 2x modulo 1. So this means that I take an x between 0 and 1, I multiply it by 2, and if the result is larger than 1, I subtract 1. And I'm interested in uh, the following thing. So I take uh, this x0, the initial state, in the interval, and I define a sequence of real numbers defined uh, recursively by xn plus 1 is f of xn. And I'm interested in the behavior of the orbit which is the sequence x0, x1, x2, and so on. So what can we say on this uh, sequence? Now, a useful tool for, for this particular map is a binary decomposition. So let me recall uh, if I look at the decimal expansion. So wh what I mean, for instance, if I write that pi is equal to 3.14159, etc., what I actually might mean by that is that pi is equal to 3 plus 1 over 10 plus 4 over 10 to the square plus and so on. So I have a decomposition into powers of 10. Now, for a binary decomposition, I do the same thing, but with powers of 2 instead of 10. So, if I write that a certain x is given by 0 point b1, b2, b3, and so on, that means that uh, x is given by b1 over 2, plus b2 over 2 squared, plus b3 over 2 to the 3, and so on. So here, the bi have value either 0 or 1. Now, you may wonder whether this decomposition is unique. And it is not quite unique. And you may know for the decimal expansion that 0 0.999, and I repeat 9 an infinite number of times, and let me denote this by 0 0.9 to the infinity, that is actually strictly equal to 1. And you may have seen proofs of that result, so one possibility is to use properties of the geometric series I talked about recently when I talked about Feynman diagrams. Well, you have the, the same for binary decomposition, so 0 0.1 infinity is equal to 1.0 infinity. But this one has to be aware of, but it's not really a big problem. One just has to make a choice if one prefers the left-hand or the right-hand notation. Now, why is this binary expansion useful for the dyadic transformation? Well, because of the, the following thing. So, if I take an x like that, what happens when I multiply x by 2? 
Well, you know that in decimal expansions, when I multiply a number by 10, I just shift all digits to the left. Well, in binary expansion, when I multiply x by 2, I will get also a left shifted sequence. So it will be given by b1 dot b2, b3, and so on. And now I have to take this modulo 1, but that just amounts to dropping the integer part, which is given by this b1. So what I find is that f of x is equal to 0 0.b2, b3, b4, and so on. So that is what we call a shift. So it means that in binary notations, my map will just shift all digits, binary digits, to the left, and you discard the first digit after the, the decimal point or the binary point. And one important remark here is that xn will be smaller than one half if and only if the first digit of xn is equal to zero. And that is the same as saying that b n plus 1 is equal to 0. So what you see here is that if I know the binary expansion of my initial state, I immediately know where the iterates will be compared to 1 half. So for every uh, binary digit equal to 0, I will be smaller than 1 half and otherwise larger than 1 half. Now this has some uh, interesting consequences. So let's first talk about periodic orbits. So an orbit is periodic if the pth iterate for some p, xp, is equal to x0 and then automatically xp plus n will be equal to xn for all n. And here p is uh, any integer which is uh, at least 1. Now, due to this observation with the binary decomposition, I see that this is actually equivalent to x being equal to 0 dot a infinity, where a is a finite sequence of digits of length p. So a is something of the form b1 up to bp. And you also see that there are two to the p choices here of such sequences. So that immediately gives me the number of uh, such periodic orbits. Now let's look at some examples. So when p is equal to 2, one possibility would be to take for a the set 0, 1, so x would be equal to 0 dot 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, and so on. So what is uh, the value of x here? Well, one way of doing it is to use again properties of the geometric series because this is 1 quarter plus 1 over 16 plus 1 over 32 and so on. But another way is to observe that if I multiply x by 4, I shift all the digits two uh, spaces to the left and I will get 1.010101 and that is the same as x plus 1. And this I can solve for x, so 4x is equal to x plus 1, that means that 3x is equal to 1 or x is equal to 1 third. And what does my map f do? Well, 1 third is mapped by f 
So I multiply by two, I get two thirds, and it's smaller than one, so I just keep two thirds. And then if I apply f again, I multiply by two, I get four thirds. That is larger than one, so I subtract one, and I get one third. So I have indeed a, an orbit of period two. Now, the other possible orbit of period two would be x is equal to 0 0.101010. One zero, repeated, and in that case, uh, you see that four x will be one zero point uh, one zero, and so on, and that is x plus two, and that gives you x is equal to two thirds. And that, you see, is just the other point of this orbit of period two I found before. Now, another example for p equals three would be x equals 0 0.001, 0, 0, 001 repeated. And then uh, you see what happens is that if you multiply x by eight, you get x plus 1, and if you solve, you have x is 1 over 7, and that is mapped by f to 2 over 7, which is mapped to 4 over 7, which is mapped to 8 over 7 modulo 1, which is 1 over 7. So we have indeed an orbit of period 3. And there, uh, there's another orbit of period 3, uh, which will start, for instance, in 3 over 7. Now, there is a little mo a bit more general uh, type of orbit here, which we can call eventually periodic orbit. So, by that I mean an orbit that maybe does something not periodic at the beginning, but at some point it hits a cycle and then it cycles forever. And that would be uh, of the form x equals zero dot b a infinity. So I have a certain finite sequence b, and then I have a, another finite sequence a that I repeat indefinitely. And in that case, what happens is that first my orbit does what is specified in B, and then it hits a cycle and keeps returning to the same points in the cycle. Now, I claim here that actually X is eventually periodic, if and only if it is rational. So these eventually periodic points are exactly the rational points in uh, my interval. So how do I see that? Well, it's an equivalent, so let us show both directions. So uh, one direction, so I assume x is eventually periodic, so it's of the form 0 dot b a infinity. And then what I can do is that I can multiply by 2 to the power the number of digits in b. So let me denote this number by absolute value b, that's the length of b times x, well, that will be equal to b followed by a infinity. And now if I multiply this now by uh, the number of digits in a, I, I will shift once again by the length of a and I will get b a 
dot a infinity. And so you see that these two quantities, b dot a infinity and b a dot a infinity, they have the same expansion after the decimal point. And uh, so, so this implies that you can actually solve for x. It's a bit like what we did in the example. So x will be something like b a minus b, which is some integer number, divided by the difference of these powers, 2 to the a plus b minus 2 to the b. And here the numerator and denominator are integers, so this is a fraction, so this is indeed a rational number. So I've shown one direction and the other direction. Here the argument is, okay, let's assume that the initial state is a fraction, p over q, p and q are integers, q different from zero, and then you see, well, when I apply f, all I do is multiply by 2 uh, and maybe subtract 1. And so this implies that actually the, the iterates of x0 have to be in the set 0, 1 over q, 2 over q, up to q minus 1 over q. Okay, so, so this is a finite set. And if I have a map defined on a finite set, and I keep applying this map, it has to cycle eventually. So at some point, the orbit has to, uh, to hit a value it has visited before, and from there on it will cycle. All right, so what we've seen so far is that we have uh, a lot of periodic orbits and actually the number goes exponentially so it depends a little bit on whether you want a periodic orbit to uh, to repeat only after p iterations or if uh, it is allowed to repeat several times in these p iterations so if it's allowed to repeat several times you have exactly 2 to the p periodic orbits then you also have these eventually periodic orbits, and all these correspond to rational numbers. So there's an infinity of them, but it's a countable infinity, and as you may know, there are many more irrational numbers. So the number of irrationals in the interval 0, 1 is uncountably infinite. So one way of saying it is that for any given rational number in 0, 1, you still have an infinity of irrational ones. So in this sense, these periodic orbits are rather exceptional, because if I start with just any number, as soon as it is irrational, I will not have a periodic behavior, and that is what we may call chaotic. Now, the behavior will depend uh, a lot on the decimal, on the binary expansion. So chaotic orbits, that will be all with x not in 0, 1, but without the rational. So all irrational numbers. Now some expansions of these irrational numbers may repeat a lot, so you could have expansions like maybe you have two zeros followed by one, and then three zeros followed by one, and four zeros followed by one, something like that. But you can also uh, have more interesting things. So for instance, I claim that there is a dense orbit. So dense means that this orbit will get as close as I like to any point in the interval. And a way of constructing such a, an orbit is to start with what is known as the binary Champernon constant, which has a binary expansion where you just put all possible sequences first of length 1, 0, 1, and then of length 2, 
0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, and then all sequences of length 3, and so on. And you see by construction, if I take just any number y, in uh, 0, 1, and I fix a certain positive epsilon, then I just look at uh, the first digits of y, which are up to a precision of epsilon, and I can find an n such that xn minus y is smaller than epsilon just by construction. So I have this dense orbit. Now, how about this butterfly effect, this uh, sensitive dependence on initial condition? Well, this you can also see with the binary expansion because let me take now two initial conditions, so x0 and y0. So let's say that x0 is given by 0 dot a b, where a is some finite sequence and b is some infinite sequence, and y0 is given by 0 a c, and C is uh, different from B, and actually the first digits of B and C are different. Right, so B is something of the form, uh, let's say B0, B1, and so on. C is C0, C1, and so on, and C0 is different from B0. Well, then you see that the, the distance between these two values that is, uh, that will be something like uh, 2 to the minus the length of a, because the first length of a digits are the same. But you see that if I iterate length of a times, then I see that xn minus yn will be uh, of the order of one half. Right? I mean, it's, it will be comparable to the size of my interval. Now, there, depending on, on the digits afterwards, it can be a bit smaller, but anyway, after this time n, the, the two orbits will do things which are completely different. So here I have my sensitive dependence on initial conditions. And I can also measure, measure this in a more quantitative way using uh, so-called Lyapunov exponents, but okay, let me not go into this today. So this was my first example of a system that has quite strong chaotic properties, so now let's look at a few other examples. So my next example is called the tent map, and it's actually quite similar to the dyadic transformation, except that now instead of having a monotonously increasing map with a jump, I have a continuous map which first increases and then decreases. So here you can actually do something very similar using again binary expansion. So you just have to observe that depending on the value of x, you have two different things happening. So if x is smaller than one half, then its binary expansion will start with zero after the, the dot. So it will be something of the form zero dot zero b2 b3 and so on. And its image will just be twice this number, so it will be shifted it will be 0 dot b2, b3, and so on. However, if x is larger than a half, then the first digit after the dot will be 1. 
And so when I multiply by two, I get this left shift, but then I have to take the negative of this and add two. And you can check that this actually corresponds to reversing all the digits. So it will be zero dot one minus b2, one minus b3, and so on. So every zero is replaced by one, every one is replaced by zero. So it looks a little bit more complicated than the dyadic map, but actually there's, there's a little trick, which is to say that I will transform this binary representation into another sequence And its digits will be one or minus one, and they will be given by minus one to the power b1, then minus one to the power b1 plus b2, then minus one to the power b2 plus b3, and so on. So actually what this means is that whenever two consecutive digits are equal, I put one, and if they are different, I put minus one. And what you can check is that, well, if b1 is equal to zero, that is uh, when x is smaller than one half, you will have the sequence which is given by one, and then I have minus one to the b2, because b1 is uh, equal to zero, and then I will have minus one to the b2 plus b3, and so on. And by f, this is just mapped to the shifted quantity, so minus 1 to the b2, and so on. Okay, so I still have the shift, nothing new here. But the other case, where in that case epsilon is given by minus 1, minus 1 to the 1 plus b2, because now b1 is equal to 1, and so on. And if you apply f, well, this will give me minus 1 uh, to the 1 minus b2, because of this uh, 1 minus b2 in, uh, in my expression of f here, then I will have minus 1 to the 2 minus b2 minus b3 and so on. But if I use the fact that minus 1 squared is equal to 1, this is actually the same as minus 1, 1 plus b2 minus 1 to the b2 plus b3 and so on. And so <coughs> the conclusion here is that this epsilon will be shifted to minus 1 to the b1 plus b2, minus 1 to the b2 plus b3, and so on. So I have again a shift map, just in this slightly different representation. And so most of what I said before is still true, so whenever the binary expansion is periodic or eventually periodic, so when x is rational, I will have a periodic orbit. Just the expression in particular cases will be a bit different. And when x is irrational, I will have a chaotic orbit. My third example is now a little bit smoother, so let me look at this map. X maps to lambda times x times 1 minus x, and this lambda is a parameter that could vary between 0 and 4, let's say. Now, this map has a behavior that can be very different depending on the value of lambda. So, you may know uh, this picture here. So what I've done here, I've plotted lambda on, uh, on the x-axis. And I've started at 2 because for smaller values it's uh, not so interesting. And on the y-axis I have 
plotted, I think, the iterates uh, from number 1001 up to maybe 1100, something like that. And you see that up to a certain value, which is actually 3, my system has a quite simple behavior because it is attracted by a fixed point. And then you have these period doublings. So here you have a first doubling and then you have more doublings and so on. So you have this Feigenbaum cascade of period doublings, which is quite interesting in itself, and maybe I'll talk about it another time. But what I'm interested in here is the case where uh, lambda is equal to 4. So, when lambda is equal to 4, the system uh, is actually very chaotic and it's actually equivalent in a sense to the, uh, to the tent map. So, how do we see this? Well, what I claim is so I have my map going from x to 4 times x times 1 minus x. And that is the map G4. So yeah, what I should point out is that if lambda is equal to 4, the maximum here is actually equal to 1. So I can really reach any value between 0 and 1. And now, uh, what I claim is, is the following. So, if here I have f, which is the tent map, which I showed just before. Then, these two maps are actually what we call conjugated, which means that I have a certain map h here. And this map H is, uh, is a bijective map, and it is given by H of Y equals 1 half times 1 minus cosine of pi times Y. And, uh, okay, you can look at this map. So, if I put Y here, H of Y here, its uh, graph looks something like this. So it's a nonlinear but invertible transformation of the interval 0, 1. And what I mean by, by this picture here is that if I have a sequence x0, x1, and so on, such that xn plus 1 is given by my logistic map of xn, and if I take y0, y1, where yn plus 1 is the tent map applied to yn, then uh, actually if x0 is h of x0, then xn will be equal to h of xn for all n. So this means that the logistic map for lambda equals 4 and the tent map are actually related by this invertible transformation H. So you can transpose many things I said for the tent map and for the dyadic map to the logistic map when lambda is equal to 4, except that there are some changes, uh, for instance, it's no longer true uh, that an orbit is eventually periodic if and only if the initial state is rational because my h will not necessarily send a rational number to a rational one. But still the many uh, qualitative things are the same. Now my next example is again a variant of the tent map but now I go back to this uh, piecewise linear map. But let me change the slope from 2 to 3. And I've also changed one thing because 
the map defined like this does not leave the interval 0, 1 invariant. So you, it can leave the interval 0, 1, and so I've defined it on all of the real numbers. So what you can see here is that, first of all, if uh, x0 is negative, then I'm somewhere at the left here, and xn will just keep decreasing and xn will actually go to minus infinity. Now, if x0 is larger than 1, well, then x1, you see, I'm somewhere here, so x1 will be negative, and then, again, xn will go to minus infinity, as n goes to infinity. Okay, but now I also have the case where x0 is between one third and two thirds. What happens then? Well, you see on the picture here that the image will be up here. So then x1 will be larger than one. And then by what I've seen before, I know that x2 will be negative, And again, xn will go to minus infinity. So you see we have quite a lot of cases where actually xn will go to minus infinity and the question is, are there other cases? Is it possible not to go to minus infinity? So now it is actually useful to work in basis 3 instead of 2. So let me write that x as the ternary expansion, b1, b2, b3 and so on. If x is of the form b1 over 3 plus b2 over 3 squared plus b3 over 3 to the power 3 and so on, where uh, now the bi can have value 0, 1 or 2. And the useful convention here is to say that whenever I have an expansion that stops with a, an infinite number of, of zero, then I will replace it by, so whenever it is of the form one followed by an infinity of zeros, I write it as zero followed by an infinity of twos. And if it ends with one and an infinity of twos, I will rather write it as two followed by an infinity of zeros. So the idea here is that whenever I can avoid having the digit one, I do that. <clears throat> now what happens here? So we've already seen that if x is not between zero and one third or between two thirds and one, it will go to minus infinity. So let us look at the two remaining cases. So if x is between zero and one third, well, then its expansion will be of the form zero dot zero b2 b3 and so on. And, well, then its image will be 3x. And again, I will just have a shifted sequence, 0 dot b2, b3, and so on. If x is between uh, 2 thirds and 1, then the expansion of x will start with the digit 2, and then it will be of the form 0 dot 2, b2, b3, and so on. And then, similarly to what we had for the tent map with slope 2, its image will be of the form 2 minus b2, 2 minus b3, and so on. So I just switch between the values 0 and 2. Now, when does xn goes to minus infinity? 
Well, it does so if uh, at some point uh, so some iterate will be between one third and two third, and due to this convention here, that is exactly when at some point the first digit after the dot will be one. So what I'm saying here is that actually f of x will remain in zero one for all n if and only if all its digits are different from one. Because in other cases, uh, there's an iterate which, which will be between one third and two thirds, and then the following points will go to minus infinity. <coughs> and what is this set of points? Well, I've started with the interval zero one here, and then I removed the central third, and then at each state I I keep removing uh, numbers whose uh, ternary expansion has a one somewhere. So I've removed here the, the central interval, one third, two thirds, and then the center or uh, the middle part of each of these intervals and so on. So what you get when you do this uh, infinitely often is what is called the ternary Cantor set. And I've drawn here a sequence of approximations of this Cantor set. So in general, a Cantor set is a set which is closed. So <clears throat> it is still a union of closed intervals. Or in other words, its boundary is contained in the set. However, it has an empty interior. So all points of the sets are actually on the boundary, so any point will have a neighbor which is not in the set. And it has this property that all points of the set are accumulation points. Of other points in the set. So any point in the set can be seen as a limit of other points which are also in the set. <clears throat> so, uh, this Cantor set, as you may know, is actually a fractal set. So, here we have indeed the appearance of a fractal set. Now, another remark is that, so if, if I call this Cantor set lambda, if I now just look at the map, so my tent map F3, restricted to lambda, so I only look at initial states of lambda, and then I know I will remain there forever, I can actually uh, find a map H such that after applying H, here I will have the tent map F2. So I'm saying here that up to a transformation H, my uh, tent map with slope 3 restricted to the Cantor set is actually equivalent to the tent map of slope 2 we've seen before. And what is the definition of H? Well, if I apply H to a point with a certain expansion, 0 dot b1, b2, b3, and so on, so since my point is in the Cantor set, all digits are either 0 or 2. So there's no digit equal to 1. And so I can all divide them by 2. So what this means is that if a digit is 0, it just says 0. And if it's 2, I replace it by 1. And so, you see, it's a kind of expanding transformation from my Cantor set to the whole interval 0, 1. <clears throat> now, one thing which is common to all these four examples I've given is that they are maps in dimension 1, 
And these maps are never invertible. They are actually always two to one. And many dynamical systems in practice have actually invertible maps. So this is not quite uh, satisfactory if we want to uh, describe chaotic systems, but there are examples which are quite similar and uh, which are indeed invertible. And one example is Arnold's cat map. So the idea is that uh, I think Arnold, uh, it's called cat map because he, uh, he made a picture like this of a cat here and uh, maybe it looks like like this and <clears throat> what happens to the cat after we apply this map so let's look at uh, at some points so the the point zero zero is mapped to itself that's a zero here <clears throat> now the point one zero so if I discard this modulo one, so one zero will be mapped to the point two one. So this point here will be mapped here. <coughs> and the map, the point one one will be mapped to the point two three. So this point here will be mapped here. And the point zero one will be mapped to uh, the point one one. So what happens is actually <coughs> what you see here. So the square zero one times zero one is mapped to this uh, elongated parallelogram. And now I have to apply the modulo one, but you see uh, this amounts to taking all these different pieces and putting them back to uh, the initial square. So I just have to draw a line here and then you see that this part here goes here. Then <coughs> this part here goes here, this part here goes here, and this part here stays at the same place. So I have indeed a map from the square to itself, and it's an invertible map, it's actually area preserving. And uh, so I can define its inverse, I can iterate orbits both in positive and negative time. And what happens with this map is that you see it has a, a direction which is a, a bit like, like this in which things are stretched. So if I iterate it a large number of times I will get uh, actually things which are very thin elongated along this direction here. Now this map is a bit harder to analyze than the dyadic map. We cannot use this uh, decomposition in basis two, but it has very similar properties and in particular it has this property that actually an orbit is periodic if and only if the coordinates are rational numbers. So how do you see this? Well, I can write this map as xn plus 1, yn plus 1 is equal to the matrix A times xn, yn and modulo 1, 1. And A is the matrix 2, 1, 1, 1. And you can see that any power of n consists of integers. It has integer components or integer elements which are actually Fibonacci numbers. So you can try to, to show this. So compute powers of A and show that actually the 
components, the elements of A to the N are always Fibonacci numbers. But the important thing here is that A to the N has integer elements and what does it mean to have a period P? Well, that means that A to the P times X naught Y naught should be equal to X naught Y naught plus some vector Q1, Q2 and Q1, Q2 are integers. So let's say positive integers. And this <coughs> is a linear system for X naught and it's a linear system with integer coefficients and solutions of such a system are necessarily rational numbers. So this is how you see that periodic orbits correspond to rational initial states. <coughs> okay, so here is uh, my last example for today. And this example is a bit closer to applications as we are going to see. It's also a map for, of the square form to itself, but again it has this property that only part of the points in the square will stay in the square. So what you do is that you, you start with a square here and then you elongate this square so you make it very high and, uh, and uh, quite thin in the x direction and then you bend it in the form of a horseshoe and then you overlay it with the initial square so you get this horseshoe here and so what happens here is that let me call h minus and h plus these uh, two horizontal rectangles then if I call my map F, so F of H minus will be equal to this vertical strip V minus and H of F of H plus will be equal to V plus. And points in the initial square which are not in H minus or H plus they are just mapped outside the square and so we will not be interested in them anymore in what follows. Now what happens if I apply the same transformation F once again? Well you see this horseshoe will be mapped in uh, something more complicated that makes several turns. And you see that the, the green set here so what are the points which remain inside the square? But, uh, well, it is uh, the image of these four green sets that we have here. And uh, these images, let me call them V minus minus, V plus minus, V plus plus, and V minus plus. and we will see where this uh, notation comes from. Now, one way of, of saying this is that if I want to uh, still be in the square uh, after two iterations, I must have started in points which are mapped to, to one of these four squares here. And these are actually smaller horizontal sets here. So I've drawn them right here. So I actually have H plus minus here, H plus plus, H minus plus, H minus minus. And so they are mapped to the four sets S minus plus, S plus plus, S minus minus and S plus minus, which in turn are mapped to these 
v minus minus, v plus minus, and so on. So <clears throat> what I'm saying here is that h, let me call it uh, epsilon naught, epsilon 1, will be mapped to s epsilon naught, epsilon 1, which will be mapped to v epsilon naught, epsilon 1. And I can keep doing this, apply my uh, horseshoe map additional times, and I will actually get more and more uh, smaller sets like this. So one way of describing it is, is the following. So you see what I want to show here is that again I have an invariant set which is a Cantor set, but now it's a two-dimensional Cantor set. And the way I can define these, uh, these sets uh, so H are the horizontal sets, V the vertical ones, and S the square ones. So let me say that H epsilon naught up to epsilon n, where the epsilons have value plus or minus 1, are the points which start, which start in the horizontal rectangle H epsilon naught and whose image is in H epsilon 1 and so on up to n. So, one example here would be if I just take n equals 1. So, for instance, h, h plus plus would be the set of x in h plus, such that the image is in h plus. And I've drawn this set before. So, it is here, so H plus plus, its image is here, and it is itself in H plus. So the points in H plus plus are in H plus, and the image is also in H plus. So this is my definition of the horizontal rectangles. And I can, can do something similar for the vertical rectangles, except now I go backward in time. So V, some sequence of epsilons, is defined by the fact that the pre-images of X are in certain horizontal rectangles. And then I say that the squares are the intersections of the vertical and horizontal strips. And so by construction, if I have a certain sequence indexed by time like this, so this square would be the set of axes whose orbit both in negative and positive time up to some iterations m and n are in the corresponding horizontal sets. And therefore I now know that when I send both m and n to infinity, well, I will get a, a limit of this set S, and that will be uh, a limit of this uh, type of set I've shown here, and that will be again a Cantor set. So it's a bit similar to the tent map with slope 3, except that now I am, I'm dimension 2. So what I'm saying is that this horseshoe map has an invariant set which is contained in the square which is a Cantor set and again actually the, the definition of these S here is that if I index a point by this sequence of epsilons well if I apply the map the sequence will be shifted. So I again have a shift map on a control set. So to finish let us look at a couple of applications. So so far these maps seem pretty academic, so they are 
Celtic maps, but where do they come from? Well, this horseshoe map actually comes from an application, and I've talked about it uh, in a previous lecture when I talked about stability of periodic orbits and billiards. So I talked about so periodic orbits or fixed points which can be elliptic or hyperbolic. And hyperbolic points have this property that they have stable and unstable manifolds. And so one situation you can have is that the unstable manifold of one hyperbolic point crosses the stable manifold of another hyperbolic point. And then I said that the if you follow these manifolds, they must have a very complicated shape. And this can occur, for instance, if you take the billiard in an ellipse and then you de deform the ellipse a little bit. And you can also have homoclinic intersections, so that is when actually the stable and unstable manifolds correspond to the same point. So it's something like this. So I have my unstable and stable manifold here. So the unstable manifold does this, the stable manifold does this, and they intersect at a certain point. Now this point here has uh, an orbit forward in time that will approach the hyperbolic point. And also backward in time, it approaches the hyperbolic point. But so it means that the image of this point also has to lie on the unstable manifold. And let's say the map is orientation preserving. So here it, it should do something like that. But then it will do something like that. And for many systems like billiards, the maps are area preserving. So this area is the same as this one. And uh, this area here is the same as this one. And so since the points get closer and closer, what happens is that actually I will have more and more oscillations like, like this. So these uh, parts here get thinner, but they also have to get longer. And this keeps going like that. And you see, after some point, these, this manifold will oscillate more and more and intersect itself more and more times. And this is actually related to the horseshoe map because here I have drawn a, a cartoon of the situation. So I have a hyperbolic point here. And this is the unstable manifold. And here I have the stable manifold. And both intersect at this point and then they keep intersecting like this. So I have uh, iterates of this point more and more. And now I've taken here a rectangle here, which is some neighborhood of the unstable manifold. Uh, and so its image also has to contain the manifold. And so you, so you see it has to be bent after time. So it will look like a horseshoe. And if I keep iterating, it will finally be mapped to a horseshoe like this. And that's where the horseshoe map comes from. So that was uh, introduced by Stephen Smale in the 1950s or 60s. And you can actually use what we saw for the simplified horseshoe map in this situation and show that you indeed have chaotic orbits in this case. And here is uh, very last example, which is uh, Shilnikov's uh, mechanism. So now what we have in this case is a, what is called a, a saddle focus. So here uh, I actually have an ordinary differential equation. 
and it has a fixed point somewhere, a stationary point. And if I linearize along this point, uh, I get two attracting directions, but with a, an imaginary, uh, a non-zero imaginary part. So the orbits tend to circle around the point and one unstable direction. So here I have, again, that is my unstable manifold. And one way of describing this system is to say, okay, if I linearize the system around this point, and let's say I have coordinates x, y, and z like this. So I've forgotten nonlinear terms, but that's the first approximation. So what happens here is that I, I have a, a rotation, and actually I should add something like exponential minus ct here. So the, the x and y coordinates here give me this, uh, the spiral. But at the same time, the z coordinate, because it's unstable, will tend to go. And now let us do the following thing. So, of course, it depends on, on what the global behavior of this unstable manifold is. But let's assume that if I take a, a rectangle here on a horizontal plane, it will be mapped after a while. Uh, if I take this cylinder, it will be mapped with this uh, cyan rectangle here. It could be deformed a little bit. That doesn't really matter. So I now take a set of initial conditions on this lateral rectangle. And now I want to see what happens, where are points which enter this cylinder, they will spiral like this, where they exit the top part of the cylinder again. And that means that I look for time t such that z of t is equal to 1. Okay, and that means that exponential a t should be equal to 1 over the initial value of z. And this I can solve for t, so t will be 1 over a times the logarithm of 1 over the initial z. And so you see that this time depends on the value of the initial z. So the smaller z is, the larger this time is. And when the time is larger, it means that x and y will make more turns. And so the result is that if I look where points leave this cylinder again, if they do leave it, well, they will have this type of spiral shape here. And in this spiral shape, Again, you see that we have a horseshoe here. So you can again apply this theory of the horseshoe map to show existence of chaotic orbits in this system. All right, so that is all for today. I hope you enjoyed the lecture and hope to see you soon again. So. Take care. Until next time. Bye.